Oh, break a leg, Teresa. <laughs> it's just quite funny because it's such a bizarre one. <laughs> right. All right. You're all set. So, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, and welcome to our um, November webinar. Um, and we are delighted to have Dr. Teresa McLaren with us tonight. Um, we've just been having a wee off off um, camera chat there and um, she's just told me great news so which I'll share with you now. So Dr. Teresa Mulhern is a BCBID whose research focuses primarily on the application of relational um, frame theory to teach new skills and in particular target language deficits with autistic populations. So you may already recognize Dr. Mulhern from RFT Gal. If you don't follow her um, and it's at RFT Capitals G-A-L. Um, she has recently, as she just told me there, um, accepted a lecturer position in psychology at IT Carlo and will be starting next week. So from everybody here, Teresa, good luck on that new adventure. Um, Dr. Mulhern has an extensive publication uh, record, having published in Java, the Journal of Contextual Behavioral Science, Developmental Neuro uh, Rehabilitation and the Review Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, to name just a few. Dr. Mulhern, along with colleagues, has also contributed a chapter to the book Applied Behaviour Analysis of Language and Cognition, Core Concepts and Principles for Practitioners. So in light of Dr. Mulhern's achievements to date and her contributions to the field, we are delighted to have her here with us tonight to talk about relational frame theory. And we really do feel like that we're going to learn from an expert today. So some general housekeeping just before we get to the main event. The attendance checks will pop up randomly throughout the webinar and don't worry if you miss them. Chris will keep us all right. Just enjoy, um, enjoy Dr. Mulhern's talk and always pop any questions in the Q&A section and towards the end I'll pick a selection so that we can put them to Dr. Mulhern for her expertise. So without further ado I'm going to pass you over to Dr. Teresa Mulhern and enjoy. Okay Teresa? Would Perfect. You? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so obviously the talk today is all on relational frame theory, which is a massive love of mine. And don't let the, the name frighten you. It is actually incredibly user friendly. And part of what I want to talk about today is how we can use this theory within our applied practice, but also linking in the research because there's some really nice research coming out that's giving us an idea of developmental trajectories, when we should be teaching, when not to teach. So as always, I like to give a little overview of what it is that I'm talking about. If you, by the way, want to follow along, I did put these slides up in the handouts so you can actually uh, download these as we go along. Um, I figured I'd put a very brief overview of what relational frame theory is, just so we're all on the same page. We like a, a good, uh, clear definition of things. Um, some overview of research, some of the limitations that we've seen with assessments and the directions that we might need to take as a practice. And obviously, the most important question is considering uh, how we assess in practice. How is this actually possible? And the thing is, relational frame theory sounds scary, but I promise you it absolutely is not. Um, put very, very simply, it's a contextual behavioral account of human language and cognition. So it's very much um, almost like a, a rebuttal of Chomsky's um, annoyance with Skinner over his uh, account of verbal behavior and does provide a really nice generative account of how um, language and cognition occurs. And all of this is kind of based upon uh, arbitrarily applicable derived relational responding very hard to say uh, a couple of times uh, in a row, but there you go. And it's also based on non-arbitrarily applicable derived relational responding. So that sounds tricky, but I promise you it isn't. Uh, the non-arbitrarily applicable derived relational responding, the easiest way to think of that is um, our way of looking at relationships between stimuli based upon being able to see a physical relationship. So that's something that's very clear and very tangible. So for example, um, I can see that this 
Prit stick is thicker than this pen. That's a non-arbitrary uh, relationship there because we can physically see the relationship. However, it becomes arbitrarily applicable when we can no longer see or we cannot see a physical relationship. So if I tell you uh, a quark is fatter than a quark, you can then derive that a quark is thinner than a quark. That's the arbitrarily applicable stuff. So when we look at it, we can have lots of different frames, okay? So it can be coordination, sameness. It can be comparison. It can be difference, hierarchy, temporality. There's so much out there. But the fun thing about it is that there are three core elements. And if you look at each of those uh, elements within each of those frames, you're golden. You're doing really, really well. Those are the things we have to assess for. So the first of these is mutual entailment. And that's the way in which we respond uh, to one stimulus in terms of another. So it's a relationship of two stimuli and we're seeing how they are mutually entailed. So that's um, an example of uh, A is more than B. Now, Murray Sidman had all of his fabulous research back in 1971 on stimulus equivalence. And if we were to look at it in terms of stimulus equivalence, that uh, mutual entailment is sort of like um, symmetry, that A to B relationship, but it's more than just sameness. It's looking at comparison. It's looking at distinction. It's looking at opposition. Then the next one we have is combinatorial entailment. And that's where we actually start to combine those relationships, those mutually entailed relationships. So the way that I like to think of it is the way that we are relating uh, three or more stimuli. So that's where we see um, the A to B to C relationship. So in stimulus equivalence terms, we used to think of that as transitivity. A is the same as B. B is the same as C, therefore A is the same as C, and C is the same as A. But again, plot twist, relational frame theory says, hey guys, there's more to language and cognition than just sameness. So combinatorial entailment takes that and adds in the element of additional contextual cues. And then finally, we have transformation of stimulus function. And that's basically... The nicest way to say it is how we feel towards a stimulus can change based upon functions. So we've all gone through a sort of uh, transformation of stimulus function in the last two years. If you had asked any of us what Corona was three years ago, we'd have said, oh, it's, it's a delicious beverage. Very, very nice. Uh, but this stimulus has changed based upon our experiences with what is going on right now and that has transformed that stimulus function to being quite an aversive word um so the great thing is we know that these are all generalized operants there's research out there to show they are operants and that's what we like to see in applied behavior analysis and we can establish these via multiple exemplar training which makes sense because if you look at the natural trajectory of language and cognition, when we're looking at the tiny humans, they're gaining all of these skills through natural environment learning where they are getting all of these multiple exemplar training. So like I said, all of these frames have the same characteristics of mutual entailment, combinatorial entailment and transformation of stimulus function. The way in which they differ is actually their contextual cues. So that's the thing that tells us oh, it's different to, it's bigger than, it's more than, it's opposite to. So that's kind of the, the quick whistle-stop tour of what relational frame theory is. But let's talk about what it's found so far uh, so that we can really understand why it is that we're looking at this. So the arbitrarily applicable relational responding, so that's our ability to derive relationships between things that we haven't seen that abstract level of responding. Uh, that has been found to be related to IQ and to language. And this has been across a number of researchers. So we like seeing that. Um, what was really interesting was that non-arbitrary comparison 
So that's the ability to even physically see the relationship. So um, that there are uh, three dogs here and one dog here. This side has more dogs than this side. That non-arbitrary comparison was also found to be related to IQ. So that's something really, really important for us to remember when we're going forward in applied practice that, you know, this is probably a skill that we really need to be looking at. Um, the research has also found that particular relational repertoires increase as a function of age in typically developing children. So again, we are seeing that there is a sort of a, a natural developmental trajectory to these things, but it does again feed into that idea of multiple exemplar training, that history of reinforcement, that um, derived relational responding is um, an operant. It's a generalized operant. Um, so it appears to begin with the development of non-arbitrary derived relational responding. And this kind of makes sense. So we have to start off with the non-arbitrary stuff. So that's being able to see the physical relationship. Because once we start to get really a high level of responding with that, that's when we can move on to the arbitrary abstract stuff, because that's when the contextual cues start to actually make sense. Um, but it seems to be from the research, and it, when you think about it, it's all very logical, it does make sense, that you don't have arbitrarily applicable derived relational responding unless there is a good basis of non-arbitrary derived relational responding. So again, when you're starting off and doing your uh, relational frame training with your tiny humans or big humans or whoever you're working with, you need to make sure that the non-arbitrary stuff is there. Now, um, there's some really fabulous, excellent recent research that's come out uh, from NUI Galway. Uh, so Elle Kirsten and Ian Stewart recently published a study in 2021, and they provided really valuable data regarding the developmental trajectory of these repertoires. And for me as a practitioner, I find that incredibly, incredibly useful because this gives us an idea of the, the building blocks, where we should be starting off in terms of teaching these particular skills. So what she did in her research was she came up with the ARA. So it's not like we would have here in Ireland, which is ARA, sure, it'll be grand. It's ARA, which stands for Arbitrary Relational Assessment. So it has four stages. And she very, very kindly gave me some of the, the screenshots of what this looks like. So again, this is handy for you guys to think about how you could assess these because this was a uh, PhD research uh, and it, you know you can you can do this with minimal resources. So the very first stage was the non-arbitrary relations. So again, being able to see the physical relationship between things. So if we look at the, the very uh, top row of slides, you can see there's uh, in one case, there's a circle and then underneath there's a circle, a diamond and a triangle. So uh, the participants were told find the same. So they had to match the circle with the circle and then match the elephant with the elephant. Then the next one was comparison. So you can see then there's a lizard. So they were told, you know, find smaller or find bigger, find more than, find less than. Uh, then there was opposition where they had a long line drawing. So you have to find me the opposite. So then finding the shorter one. Uh, there's a black square, find the opposite it would have been white. Then uh, the next one was non-arbitrary temporality. And she very, very cleverly just manipulated PowerPoint. And you can have PowerPoint obviously bring in objects before or after each other. So the kids would watch uh, the orange star appear and then the purple star appear. And then the question was, uh, which came before or after. Um, and then the same with the, the uh, triangle and the square. And then finally, she looked at non-arbitrary hierarchy. Now, this was where she had kind of plugged into my earlier research because I had looked at um, hierarchy and containment and there did seem to be a relationship here. So the way that she was conceptualizing um, hierarchy was to be able to physically see the relationship of containment. So that's the non-arbitrary basis. We can see that the purple box is inside the red box and the red box contains the purple box. So they would then be asked questions of, does 
the red box contain the purple box? Yes. Is the purple box inside the red box? Yes. Is uh, Does the purple box contain the red box? No, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's what the non-arbitrary stage looks like. Now, she kind of brought it that little bit further, which is what I find really interesting about this research. And again, this totally feeds into how we assess these repertoires. Um, she looked at non-arbitrary analogical relations. So analogy is, is relating relations. It is one of the more complex relational frames. Um, so the way that she looked at this was, of course, starting off with a non-arbitrary. And I, I just think it's so cool. And again, it's when you think about it, it has, it's actually quite simple, but she's laid it out in a really nice way. So the very first one we're looking at here is uh, coordination and distinction. Um, so um, you have circle to circle as and then is it square to square or square to triangle? So obviously the correct um, um answer there is square to square if you're looking for coordination and then um same thing going on with comparison of um the, there were all of these different things there to to check for the non-arbitrary uh, analogy of comparison and then of opposition temporality uh, and hierarchy so Again, you know, she has all of these particular um, tools developed, uh, I'm sure I'm putting her on the spot, but you never know if you email her, she'd probably uh, provide some of these. They're all done on Keynote and PowerPoint. And then in addition to that, she came up with stage three of the arbitrary relational assessment repertoire. And that was on the arbitrary relations. So again, Remember that the arbitrary relations, there's nothing in between the stimuli that gives you a physical clue about what's going on. Our responding is totally based upon the contextual cues. So in that first one, we can see there's a green square and then a little orange square and the letter S. So the letter S actually uh, denoted same. She did lots of like um, uh, early research kind of figuring out what kids would respond to, but she also plugged in a little piece of audio that they could click the S and it would say same. So they were then told green is the same as orange and then asked questions on it, is orange the same as green? And then we have a, a further relationship there where we see uh, yellow is the same as purple, purple is the same as blue, blue is different to red. So then they would be asked questions on that. There was an element of a combinatorial entailment in that. And again, we look um, to arbitrary comparison where they're told blue is more than green. So is green less than blue? Um, and then there's arbitrary opposition where the blue is opposite to green is green opposite to blue and so on and there's temporality and there's hierarchy where for instance blue is inside red does red contain blue so again it just kind of shows we can we can assess these things with fairly minimal things like a lot of us do have a uh, powerpoint keynote uh, or we can even just do some of these things out uh, laminating a lot of our tools so that's that's quite cool and the very final stage was arbitrary analogical relations so that's the the probably most complex of all of the skills the relating of relations but on a more abstract level I'm not even going to try and do this right now because it's late at night and I've I've been working all day but if you look at the first one, it's blue is the same as yellow, yellow is the same as red, red is opposite to green, so blue is to yellow as, and which one would you be going for? You'd probably be going for the yellow is to red if we're going for analogy. So she did that then across all of those um, relational frames. So this gives you an idea as to what the research actually looked like, but in my opinion, one of the most important things was we got a very nice developmental trajectory of what we should expect. So she looked at kids between the ages of three and seven. And I don't think any of us are wildly surprised that coordination, sameness was one of the first things to, to come out. 
And, and yeah, Tiana, I agree. It would take me a while. And I think rather importantly in her research, she did let the kids have time. This wasn't a thing of like, no, you must respond in X amount of minutes because she was trying to assess these particular things. But it does make you think, could we maybe uh, combine with this with a little bit of precision teaching to really augment this a little bit further just just a general little research idea there but I don't think any of us would be wildly surprised that court yes they were typically developing uh, children I think that's quite important because it gives us a developmental trajectory because I mean when you think about it, all of our data uh, when we're teaching things to our um, clients is based upon normative data. We are looking at what would be typical for them within their age group or what is appropriate. So they found that coordination was one of the first ones to come out. Not a massive surprise, that makes sense. We need coordination. Um, one of the first ways that that comes out is naming. You know, that's our very first um, example of derived relational responding. It's a kid seeing a cat and saying cat coordination at sameness. So that's the first thing that came out. And then they found, interestingly, comparison was the second one to come out. And I personally feel a certain amount of that probably comes out with the EO of really understanding comparison. You really want to make sure that you are getting more biscuits than your brother, you know, um, and, and particularly at that non-arbitrary level. Remember that stage one was the non-arbitrary stuff. Then we found that hierarchy was the next one. Again, think of like the, the typically developing trajectory. This kind of makes sense. Kids are told a lot of like, put your uh, foot in the shoe, put the toys in the box, uh, put your lunch into the lunch box. And then opposition was fourth. Kind of makes sense. It's a tricky one. And temporality was the final one to come out. Um, so again, this is really handy for us when we are in applied practice and we're thinking, how am I going to teach these particular frames? A, we start off non-arbitrarily. And when we, when we do start off non-arbitrarily, we're going to make sure that we have a really good coordination frame started. Then we're going to get on to comparison, then to hierarchy, then to opposition, and then to temporality. Now, she also looked at her stage two, which was the non-arbitrary analogy. And again, she found that the non-arbitrary analogy of coordination, so um, white is to white as black is to black, was the first thing to come out. And then we had hierarchy, then comparison, then temporality, and then opposition. Now, analogy is a really interesting one to look at because if you look at things like the Stanford BNA fifth edition, if you go very high up in terms of the verbal IQ, those are some of the, the the tasks that are very, very linked to IQ. So again, this is giving us a really nice sort of um, a, a how-to on how to assess these things and how to potentially teach these particular things. Because remember, we have research that does show uh, all the way back to Cassidy 2011, uh, I did research recently that was published in 2020 that showed that we can use relational frame training to increase IQ uh, from anywhere from nine points up to 15 or 18 points. And those were with more basic frames. So if we're if we're looking at these sort of things, absolutely, Fiona. Yeah, analogical reasoning is incredibly important. And this is why we need to, to have something like our non-arbitrary basis of analogy before we start thinking about the the arbitrary stuff and then again she has her stage three which is all about the arbitrary stuff so that's the abstract stuff where we're totally basing our responding based on contextual cues again the coordination was the first thing to come out with are we that surprised not really but then we have opposition came out then comparison then temporality and then hierarchy and again, I think Piaget would kind of be almost a little bit happy with that because Piaget would state that, you know, that scientific reasoning, that's the hallmark of hierarchical relational responding, doesn't emerge until kids are much older. But we're, we're, um, we're behaviorists here. We don't think that these things magically occur. Um, and then finally, she had a really amazing stage four, which was the arbitrary analogical uh, 
um, assessment. And again, finding coordination was one of the first things to come out, then opposition, then comparison, then temporality, and then hierarchy. So again, we have these assessment tools already developed. They're, they're, they're there, they're coming out. Uh, the PhD students are some of the best in terms of coming out with these uh, particular tools. And I, I, I am quite biased because Elle is quite wonderful. But her research showed that non-arbitrary comparison was the only non-arbitrary relation that showed significant correlations with age, with IQ score, with the overall arbitrary relational assessment score and the overall ARA, so the arbitrary relational assessment score for each stage. So at stage one, two, three and four. So that says that non-arbitrary comparative relations seems to be really, really important for intellectual potential. So for our emergence of arbitrary relational framing as well, and for analogical responding. So we need to really consider when we're coming up with a program that we are focusing on non-arbitrary com comparison and ensuring that it's to a really high degree. So the research to date does show us that tools like the ARA can be integrated with existing assessment protocols and curriculums. We're not saying, hey, get rid of the VB map or, or get rid of the peak. This is a, a, an additional item that you can use to augment your research or to augment your applied practice. So probably the, the RFT um assessment protocols that you may be used to or you may have learned about is uh, PEAK. So PEAK is, is uh, very well known. Uh, yeah, uh, Dixon is uh, massively involved in that. Uh, and in fact, if you look at each of these papers, Dixon has his name on each of them. Uh, Rousey in 2015 conducted a principal component analysis of the PEAK relational training system, and they provided support as a conceptually systematic approach to teaching and to support. So we already have some frameworks out there. Uh, uh, yes, and Ruth Rayfelt is, is massive there as well absolutely and she's a wonderful book um on on the topic uh Mikhail et al in 2015 also used peak to teach autoclitics tax and guessing skills to three autistic children and it maintained at two weeks Mikhail matas in 2017 used peak to teach gustatory visual and auditory relations to three adults with developmental disabilities including asd and intellectual disability so we already have some frameworks but obviously we are a science. We like to change, we like to adapt based upon uh, the information that we're getting. We're even seeing that obviously, um, even back in 2015, they're doing a principal component analysis and, and checking out the stuff that's working or may not be working. That's what we're doing as a science. We're making sure things are working. Now, I had a little look at the peak because I like to, to look at um, assessment tools. That's apparently my, my, my way of entertaining myself these days. Now, overall, it's a, it's a really interesting assessment tool. However, there are some questions that pop up here and there that do not consider cultural or geographical context. And some of these questions were things like, um, the sun came out at night, what was wrong with that sentence? Now, I have a, a very dear friend of mine who lives in Finland, and there is a period of the year where they basically don't have any light um, there is no sun even though it is technically daytime so if you run that with a Finnish child or a Swedish child or a Norwegian child they're going to be a little bit confused about why that's wrong so there are some contexts that we have to think about um, it's also very American heavy um, which is fine uh, but if uh, what if you're asked, how much is this? I see what I think is a dollar bill and some form of a coin. I've never been to America, so I don't actually know how much that is, but I would fail on that level of, of the peak. Um, I also wouldn't be able to, to identify the five cents or the 15 cents. Um, then one of the questions is, if you were this tornado, how would you feel? I live in Ireland, we have uh, very moderate weather and uh, most children don't know what a tornado is because it's not culturally very relevant to us until we're much older in uh, second level or third level where we're starting to learn about these things. So 
although it's a really fantastic framework, there are some limitations to these methodologies in terms of assessment tools because they don't think about those cultural or geographical contexts. So I think a lot of practitioners to date, um, yeah, even Van is saying we don't use coins in Vietnam. So that's going to be really confusing if you're <laughs> if you're there with with your kids doing um, like a peak assessment and you you're actually just having to scrap whole parts of your assessment because you don't have the information in that and you can't even sub in coins to try and, and figure out these particular things. And remember, if we're talking about uh, non-arbitrary versus arbitrary um, relations, actually coins can have a, a big impact there because in Ireland, we have a 50 cent piece and we have a one euro piece, but the 50 cent piece is bigger than a one euro piece. So a kid might want to pick out a 50 cent piece because it's physically bigger than a one euro piece. So they're they're responding based upon non-arbitrary comparison, not based upon arbitrary comparison of one euro is worth more than 50 cents. Uh, as Americans, we have had to adjust many of our testing protocols to reflect geographical and cultural sensitivity. Yeah, it just goes to show this is an evolving science. Anything where we're working with human beings, we are just going to have to adapt. Um, I know that myself, um, I have quite a strong accent, so it's it's difficult sometimes for, for some of my clients to understand me if they themselves are not Irish. So we are just constantly having to evolve as a science to try and figure these particular things out. So this kind of brings us to the question of how exactly are we going to assess relational frames? Well, it comes back to what I was saying earlier. There are three things that you need to know. Mutual entailment, combinatorial entailment, and transformation of stimulus function. If you know these three things, you can plug them into any particular relational frame. You can do that with minimal resources. You can absolutely use the peak. You may have to adapt it based upon uh, the culture or the context that you're in. Uh, you can use the ARA. So I know that Elle um, is currently uh, getting ready for her Viva in December, and she is looking towards making uh, an assessment protocol of that. So she may be one to, to contact, uh, soon to be Dr. L. Kirsten. Um, there is also the TARPA, which was uh, developed by Dr. Siri Ming, uh, also formerly of NUI Galway. Um, Galway has a lot of uh, RFT specialty, uh, partly due to Dr. Uh, Ian Stewart. But the TARPA is a really nice one because it can also assess for those relational precursors. Um, so that those conditional discriminations, the auditory um, conditional discriminations that we have to have, because as with any program, there are precursors that we have to look for. Uh, the learner readiness skills, the attending, the joint attending, uh, general listening skills. But what I would say is use what you have. Uh, bring it back to the basics. Uh, one of the great things about applied behavior analysis is that we kind of tend to do things on a shoestring budget, or at least maybe that's how I've been doing it. Um, when I did my PhD research and I was looking at uh, teaching class inclusion responding, uh, we were actually using physical containers to outline the relationship between the stimuli, i.e. that the class of animals literally contained cats and dogs. So we were showing the non-arbitrary relationship there. So bring it back to what you have. Uh, we use a lot of stimulus prompts within um, ABA. So why not think about those for, for things like um, teaching opposition? Um, if you want to teach uh, black is opposite to white, have white be physically closer to, to the child. Um, again, consider the research. In, in applied practice, which frames should you start with? Well, based upon what Elle is saying, and we go all the way back to Lipkins and Hayes research back in 1993, and it is saying that some of the first relational frames that do emerge are coordination. So we would want to start off with coordination. And we need to start off with non-arbitrary before we start thinking about arbitrary relational responding. 
Now, you might say, well, Teresa, that's super, super obvious. Of course, we're going to start off with non-arbitrary. Well, my my sweet summer children, let, let me tell you, it's not always that uh, incredibly obvious. Uh, quite a few researchers have gone in and thought to teach arbitrary relational responding and seen that there hasn't been any sort of a movement in terms of that skill. And they have had to think about it and actually go back and realize that it was not that the non-arbitrary relational repertoire was not strong enough there. Um, Behrens and Hayes did a really fantastic um, article back in 2007. I believe it was published in Java. It's a really, really nice one. And they had two of the kids that they were working with and they just couldn't get them because they were teaching them in dyads. They couldn't teach them arbitrary comparison and they were kind of going, what on earth is happening? And actually, they went and they assessed non-arbitrary comparison and realized that these typically developing kids didn't have non-arbitrary comparison to a strong enough degree. So, as always, we shouldn't make any assumptions, even if we are working with uh, neurotypical kids, uh, we should also be considering the, the non-arbitrary thing. So based upon this, um, you know, if you are uh, looking at teaching these particular skills, start off non-arbitrarily we are already doing an awful lot of that like even if you look at the vb map we're doing our matching our, our tacting our um listener skills we're doing our a to b b to c um uh, training there that bi-directional training of the the non-arbitrary coordination but then we have to think about how we are assessing these other frames um things like comparison now comparison is a tricky one because there's there's so many ways that you could look at comparison. It is not just a case of more than, less than, bigger than, smaller than. Uh, there are so many different types of frames of comparison. You could probably get hundreds out of them, whiter than, blacker than, sweeter than, saltier than. Um, so pick the, the comparative frames that would be of uh, signif significance there. So for instance, for us, it might be, uh, you know, sunnier than because, you know, the Irish, we're, we're always very concerned with weather and living in a constantly wet climate. We do like to think of, oh, well, where will we go on holiday? Well, Spain is sunnier than Edinburgh, so we'll probably go to Spain. Uh, so start off with your non-arbitrary stuff. Don't underestimate the importance of comparison because it does seem to be the key to not only later arbitrary comparison, but to other arbitrary relational repertoires overall and to IQ. Now, we, are, we have other amazing training tools out there, um, like there's smart training that you can get on raiseyouriq.com. That being said, I think it's a fabulous tool and I've used it myself in my own research, but for a lot of us who are in applied practice, it's gonna to be too advanced um, because you're gonna need a certain, a certain amount of reading skills. There is a timer element to these things. It's at the moment, I believe, more catered towards um, neurotypical children. However, you could um, train or work with your uh, clients to get them to that point of readiness of the, the basic mutual entailment, combinatorial entailment, transformation of stimulus function. So I think the transformation of stimulus function is always the thing that, that gets people a little bit confused about how to look at those. Comparison is probably the easiest way to, to teach the transformation of stimulus function piece um, because, you know, when we're looking at more than, less than, we are looking at which is the thing that we would want more or less. So if I said to you, I have um, five EPACs and uh, 70 equirals, but EPACs are uh, 20 times more uh, valuable than equals you're probably going to want the epacs I find it hard to follow my train of thought so forgive me if I've gotten a little bit lost but that could be one way that we teach these we're already trying to teach a lot of skills to our clients non-arbitrary comparison and, and arbitrary comparison is in my view one of the one of the critical skills that we need for everyday life, we we look at it in terms of having finance programs where we're teaching um, kids how to 
uh, potentially go to the shops and buy stuff. So do you have enough money? Do you think you will mo need more or less than 20 euro to get all of your shopping needs? So these are these are things that we would have to consider. Um, but that's that's essentially it. I think I'm a little bit under time and Nicola is going to be a little bit annoyed at me. Um, but I guess, um, yeah, that's that's essentially a, a huge amount of it. Like I said, start with your non arbitrary. Uh, go start off with your coordination. Think about comparison and how important that is. We're still getting more and more data about things like temporality, which is often a skill that's that that kids struggle with that before and after. Think about the tools that you can use that's at your disposal. Things like PowerPoint, um, you can use that to teach before and after with these particular skills. So. It, it is actually deceptively simple relational frame theory. Is there a book that I would recommend for reading about RFT and utilizing in early intervention practices such as home programs? Um, okay, so people will probably try to recommend the uh, purple book, the uh, uh, Barnes, Holmes and Roach book of 2001. I personally think that's uh, a little bit too nitty gritty for a practitioner gets to a level of depth that we don't necessarily need. I think um, the likes of Learning RFT, uh, which was written by, oh gosh, I can't remember now. Oh, Tornica, Nicholas Tornica is really, really nice to get your, your head around relational frame theory. I would also say that Ruth Ann Rayfelt's book on derived relational responding uh, provides some really good ideas on how to do uh, and teach these particular things. I am also in the process of writing a book um, at the moment, which will outline some some information on how to do these particular things. I'm going to have some examples of how to do these things. So that should be coming out in the next year or so. But I have lots of things planned. So there you go. How do you support children with English as second language when assessing? That's a that's a really good question because you're already dealing with somebody who who is dealing with coordinate responses. Um, they already are probably dealing with a totally different uh, relational frame of arbitrary coordination in that, say, for instance, if their language is French, uh, their their uh, coordinate uh, repertoire of hello isn't just hi, hey, there is bonjour, salut, all of these particular things. Um, and we, we have to remember, actually, there, there's research that comes from developmental psychology that Kids who have a second language typically score lower on um, means of uh, language assessment than children who just have a first language. Um, so I would say keep that in mind. Um, in terms of assessing, do the, what L did pair it all the way back don't have it be language language heavy so she had the contextual cue of same like literally when when the stimuli were put in front of the kids it was uh, green purple same so you could even plug in the the uh, word for same uh, or different in their language to to assess that particular thing that would be my advice on that um joe are there any intro to rft blog um from what i remember there were a few written um that are available on abai because um the rather excellent uh, dr ian tyndall of the university of chichester was in charge i think two or three years ago and it was quite RFT focused. So there are a number of blogs, if you go back into the back catalogue of ABAI that talks about RFT and uh, going all the way from smart training to, I actually wrote a blog at one point about class inclusion and how to teach class inclusion responding using RFT. So ABAI is actually a really great little resource for that. Any other questions, thoughts, comments, queries? Thank you, Sahil. There you go. There's one there. Yes. Hi, Anna. 
you want to, I'm just going to come in there. You go ahead there, Teresa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Tahina then says, can you tell us some fun, surprising or particularly socially valid ways you were able to apply this? Well, um, I talked briefly about my uh, study that I did back in 2020, where we actually used smart training. So that was the raiseyouriq.com, which was all RFT training that was uh, conducted um, or, or made by uh, Brian Roach from NUI Maloose. And it is quite tricky, but one of the things that we looked at was actually getting data from the kids that we were working with. Uh, they were aged between six and 10, and we had 49 participants in all. And the overwhelming um, uh, response that we got back was that they enjoyed it. That was one of the thematic responses that we got. We also uh, found a theme of intrinsically, of it being intrinsically rewarding, that they enjoyed the challenge. So they liked that. Um, I also found when I was doing my PhD research, um, I uh, did a series of single subject research designs because it was very much like, let's test this out and see how this is going before we go into the group design waters. And um, I was working with, um, I think, five and six year old kids and uh, just them getting very uh, excited about understanding um, the, 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 the concept of containment. Uh, it was also very, reinforcing for me uh, when the kids were getting so excited about me coming and getting quite sad about the the project ending. I had quite a few kids asking, were we going to do any further research? So that was always uh, very, very nice uh, to see. Um, so in terms of surprising ways, I suppose that when I looked at teaching class inclusion responding, so that's, uh, by the way, Piaget said that this particular skill didn't emerge until seven. And that's the ability to basically see an object as belonging to a class, but also being an object in and of its own right. So um, say, for instance, uh, a dog is a dog, but it's also an animal. So if I place three dogs and five cows in front of you and I ask you, are there more cows or are there more animals? If you have class inclusion responding, will correctly tell me that there are more animals but kids below the age of seven really struggle with that and we looked at that as being uh, both uh, a non-arbitrary comparison and an arbitrary uh, containment or hierarchy skills so we broke it down as that so we looked at a, a non-arbitrary comparison where we we could physically have the number of cards to say here are one, two, three, four, five cows. Here are one, two, three dogs. And the way that we showed or containment was to put the, the cats and dogs into their respective containers, which then belonged into a big animal container. And the kids loved that. They were like, here, it's going into the dog container and it's going into the cat container. And it was just one of those instances where you think, oh my God, we need so little in, in the applied context to actually teach some really tricky skills so we were teaching that to three-year-olds so four years earlier than they technically should have gotten that so that was in my opinion quite cool um uh, uh nicola what piqued my interest in this area um i think because i was in the nuig i was in a really good position of there's a lot of rft research that was where i did my phd that was where i did my masters and Working in the applied area, I, I could just, I saw quite a, a few rote responses of, you know, somebody always saying hello rather than hi there or hey, how's it going? Um, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is very much like kids have learned from a script. Is there anything that we can do to maybe make that a bit more generative? Like, um, uh, I believe there's a, a really lovely quote from Hayes that says that generative language is to speak with meaning and to listen with understanding. And that's really what RFT is. So I was going through my first year of my master's kind of going, oh my gosh, we need to find something that's really generative. There I was thinking that I was the first person that had had this thought, obviously not. And then um, I started to work with Laura Moran, who is an incredible relational frame theorist as well, and an, a, an amazing applied practitioner. And we were working on a program together and she started telling me about relational frame theory. 
I started to read into it. Uh, she started to show me some of the research and how it could be applied. And that was it. I was hooked and uh, just wanted to do more and more research on that. Uh, that was that was how that went. Uh, Chrissy then says this is a bit of a different issue, um, but required for RFT. How would you strengthen or teach stimulus discrimination if listeners are struggling with this skill? Yeah, I, I, like you said, it is a required skill for RFT. I kind of touched on, that's one of your precursor skills. They need to have the conditional discrimination. Comes back to your prompts. There's no particular way of like, this strategy will always work. I've had uh, kids where I've tried gesture prompts with them and they don't get it. Uh, I've tried stimulus prompts and they get it. You know, maybe the um, SD bigger than the other stimuli in the array, uh, placing the SD closer to them, um, you know, having a green background behind the correct stimulus, um, the coic prompts, verbal prompts. Um, it's, it totally depends as to how you are teaching these particular things. So there's no one particular answer. This will always work because depending upon your population, you're going to have a totally different outcome. Um, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I was recently beginning with a client and realized he was missing an ability to, write, to derive meaning from figurative language. So I was going to go back to Dixon's relational training book. I've not used this book yet. Would you recommend this or using a different program? Yeah, yeah I think Dixon's uh, work is really, really strong. Um, like I said, uh, my I don't even want to say it's an issue because it's, just, it's a very, very strong program uh, would be around the cultural or geographic context. But that's something that, I mean, let's face it, as practitioners, we are incredibly adaptive. So we're very good at um, changing these particular things. Well, then, Gillian, if you're in the US, uh, Dixon's program is going to work quite nicely for you because that is made uh, with a US uh, program in mind. I would also have a little look at um, Elle's recent research. So Elle Kirsten, um, she published with the ARA, so the Arbitrary Relational Assessment. And if you're going back to that figurative language of, you know, the, the non-arbitrary and arbitrary coordination, her stuff might provide a really nice, super basic, back to basics, let's you know do this without any bells and whistles that could be a really really nice way of looking at it uh the name of her book well it's not a book per se but it's uh it's a recent uh, research article actually um so it was published in 2021 so if you just google l kirsten and ian stewart 2021 arbitrary relational assessment you should be able to get it and um Elle is, is rather excellent. She runs her own practice and she's always been very good about sharing materials, I say, and you never know. But you know how we are in ABA. We do have a tendency to like to, to share our resources. So she might be willing to share some information on that. But again, we have things like the TARPA, which uh, Siri Min came up with. So you're kind of lucky in that we're in 2021 now when I was doing my PhD ex number of years ago we didn't have as many assessment tools uh, for RFT so you are not quite spoiled for choice but you definitely actually have choice where there was not choice several years ago but yes um any other thoughts comments queries yeah it's definitely exciting I'm I'm obviously very biased because I love a bit of RFT but thank you so oh thank you very much <laughs> Yeah, if there's any other <laughs> queries. Um, of oh, Teresa, we could listen to you all night, honestly. Um, you just have a lovely way of delivering as well, which is really nice. And, you know, your students, your new students are going to be so lucky to have you as well. Oh, there's Daniel who's just come in with a question for you. Do I think RFT is a new or post Skinnerian approach? Well, if you go based upon the uh, Barnes, uh, Holmes and uh, Hayes book 2001, they did say relational frame theory was a post Skinnerian approach to language. I, I think of it as an extension to things. And, and if anything, it, I think it quite nicely builds upon Murray Sidman's work of 1971. Um, it does really extend upon these things. I don't think RFT is necessarily bringing anything 
new new to the table it's it's not saying oh reinforcement is bogus we don't need it it's actually saying hey these are generalized operands and that's what skinner was talking about skinner talked about mans and tax and echoics as generalized operands and these are operands as well so it's it's absolutely i think an extension of skinner's theory it this is almost like a our little um our, our little rebuttal back to Chomsky, who was saying, hey, you, you can't give us generative language. And it's like, well, it only took us a few years, but here we go. Here's relational frame theory. A uh, ball is now in your court, cognitive psychology. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Teresa, um, unless anybody else has any, and um, uh, just even you can see everybody's more, um, it's just thanking you and saying great talk and you've made it so a beautiful way of explaining RFT from Roberta there. Um, and I think I can say all of us felt the same as well. Um, thanks so much for your time, um, especially with starting your new post in a week's time. Um, we really appreciate it. And it's a fantastic um, presentation tonight. And on behalf of everyone here, i um, just like to say thank you for your time. And th again, thanks so much for such a lovely, concise and detailed um, presentation as well. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I got to geek out. Oh, Sabrina. Uh, Sabrina is another, Sabrina Norwood is another fantastic RFT researcher to have a little uh, look out for. Uh, she does some really interesting research. So yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm just geeking out because I'm seeing some people. <laughs> you oh! found her, are you? <laughs> just a little. Uh, but no, thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. And you've made the handouts available for everyone as well. Um, and the talk has been, look at that, I'm so inspired. So there you go. You've inspired someone as well. Well, you know, my my email is uh, mulhernt at itcarlo.ie. That's my new one I'm trying to remember. Um, <laughs> have any questions or uh wish to run anything by me it may take me a while to respond but i will get to you eventually <laughs> yes and honestly thank you so much again and all i can say is that this will be available and um, we'll make that available in a few weeks as well for people who weren't able to make it tonight um and all i can say is thank you Teresa, and good luck in the new post thank you so much and thank you everyone for attending and, and asking questions you guys really brought it to life that a little bit further so I really do appreciate it okay have a nice um, evening and take care okay thank you, Bye. thank you everyone for attending and your CEO, uh, CEU checks as well for everybody who wants to see you they will be available um once you log once you complete the um the last bit of this as well and Corolla says hope you stay in touch with CBA QB oh yeah I already demand that you must bring me back again for something anything uh, there you go it's recorded it's just, proof right that's it <laughs> key, you know something <laughs> okay, okay Teresa take care thank you bye bye, -bye. bye.